Welcome everyone to the um, June 13th City Council work session. Welcome to everyone here at home and we're into a um, another continuation of our discussion on Envision Eugene. As I recall when we left we had an amended motion but we did not act on that motion and then we had a, a request to discuss the DAG property, right? And whether right. that was a good potential property. And City think, manager. And I think we also, maybe Emily can just review uh, what we have our mm -hmm. already actions that council is, uh, seems to be supporting. So she could just do a quick recap. Happy to. Um, and we'll want to include these when the motion is made again, and I'll try to be able to do that for you. So the main motion currently on the table uh, is to direct the city manager to prepare for a formal adoption process, planning documents to establish a new urban growth boundary based on recommendations in the technical components document, attachment A, uh, and that carry forward the pillars and strategies described in the Envision Eugene draft proposal on March 14, 2012. The attachment A has already been updated, uh, revised to include the council's amendment that added Russell Creek area to the list of single family home expansion areas that staff will continue to analyze. And at your last session, the council uh, voted in favor of five additional amendments that are not yet reflected in this document. They are, uh, if you have this, you can follow along, but I'll try to be clear. Uh, under the commercial and industrial lands heading, under the land for industrial jobs subheading, the manager's recommendation column would uh, include a new box C that states direct staff to include consideration of compatibility issues between industrial and residential uses and expansion areas, and direct staff to include consideration of environmental justice issues related to the siting of industrial uses and expansion areas. The second uh, motion that passed was to revise the land for parks and schools heading to read land for parks, schools, and government. And under that heading uh, in the manager's recommendation column, add a third box that states direct staff to further analyze the pros and cons of adding the airport to the UGB. And finally, under the heading residential lands in the first box, in the manager's recommendation column, replace the existing text with the following text, direct staff to plan for a housing mix of 52% single family and 48% multifamily. So are you, that's, we're just uh -huh. ready to continue yeah. the discussion? Uh -huh. Okay, so did you wanna talk to us about the, um, the DAG issue? Only that, we did confirm that the consultant could include that in their uh, goal five work, if that's the council's interest. Okay, and there was no reason for no reason to not do that. to. Well, I, I guess maybe Carolyn would jump in here um, a little bit, but I think we, when we went through our analysis so far, we didn't include that initially. So it's not we can we can look at it, but I, I'm not sure that there's um, there, there were reasons why it wasn't included. So mm -hmm. I, so as we do our analysis, we'll come back and, and talk to you about whether or not there's, uh, it's appropriate to continue looking at that. And Just um, because it is resource lands, because it's uh, designated for um, forest lands, it just has a much higher bar to pass before we can legally bring that in. So it, um, we, we can certainly look at it, but we just wanted to point that out. So uh, George, does that um, satisfy your um well, I just <clears throat> you're, uh, I just want to make sure that it is included in the study, and I if if ha I guess I'll go ahead and put the, the motion out now, and then I'll speak to it if I get a second. And it says move to amend the attachment A technical components document by adding the DAG trust property to the list of potential single family home expansion areas that staff will continue to analyze in the residential lands land for single family homes section. Manager's recommendation, recommendation column box D. Second. Moved and seconded. <clears throat> now, first of all, I, I'd just like to say that I have no interest in this property. I'm not going to gain anything from it. It's it just in reading the letter that was sent to us by the uh, the, the property owner's uh, attorney, there are a number of reasons why I think it should be included. Um, you know, first of all, it's three tax lots, two of which are already abutting the 
urban growth boundary, all three tax lots uh, are owned by the same person. It's a total of 205 acres. Um, it's undeveloped and is not, in, and I'm going to quote from the letter because I, some folks may not have had a chance to get to it. It's undeveloped and is not intensely, uh, intensively managed for farm or forest use. Has one owner and limited, uh, not limited by previous development. The owner greatly desires to be included in the UGB. Um, you know, m many of the uh, property owners in the other study areas are pretty much adamant they don't want to join in. Uh, has no mapped or inventoried wetlands, nor are there any hydraulic soils. Um, yeah, let's see, the shape and topo topography are, are conducive to single family residential development. Um, over two thirds of the property is at zero to 20% slopes. Um, while designated forest, it's not intensive managed for farm or forest uses. Um, the um, so one other thing is, is it feasible to plan for it because it's not developed at this time. The master planning can be done or some sort of a planning can be done now for the entire parcel, three parcels. And it's feasible to plan for affordable housing at the same time that market rate housing is developed. There's a great potential for a mix of housing stock and ranges of affordability. So, and this is, you know, this is coming from their attorney. I, I know there may be some legal questions as to if we can continue looking at it or not. I just think it's, you know, it's, uh, looks like there's less pushback and less hurdles to go over on this property than some of the others, and I think it deserves a, a second look or, or maybe even a first look by everybody. Okay, thank you for that. Alan? So maybe you can go into a little bit more uh, detail about why it wasn't included um, in the initial. You did look at it. You chose not to include it. And... Um, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with it, except if, if it's just going to create more work that we already rejected for legitimate reason, then we're just adding something to the plate that's not necessary or, or not going to result in anything. We'll ask Melissa to address that question. Melissa Hansen with planning right behind you. Um, so in, I, as I walked you through, I think it might have been at the end of last year, our original study areas, um, what the state requires that we look at first are all those lands that are, are designated or planned for rural, residential, commercial, or industrial, basically lands that are not resource lands. And we, the state it basically asked that we exhaust looking at all of those or studying all of those before we move on to looking at any resource land. So you'll know Bailey Hill, Gimble Hill is predominantly um, rural residential. Um, over in the LCC basin, there is an area there that is rural residential. <coughs> so those are you know, reasons why we're we're still continuing to study those. We have not yet looked at the DAG property because it's that next tier of lands, or actually the third tier of lands that we looked at, which, which would be the forest lands and the farm lands. Which is so we haven't looked at this particular area. We've looked at some rural residential lands that are nearby and did screen those out of our study at this time. So we didn't specifically look at this land. Correct. Because um, we didn't need to because we didn't get there. Correct. Well, and maybe Emily can add the finer point on that. I think <coughs> that the burden of proof as we look, go through the state process will be to demonstrate why would we pick another land over the other first tier categories of land. Right. That was my next question, which was, so, yeah, so what would you have to do in order to, if that one were determined to be brought in, wouldn't you have to go through an analysis of looking at a whole bunch of other lands? We'd have say to say we're not bringing those in, and then we finally got to this one, and this is the one we're bringing in. Right? Exactly. So we'd it's have the to prioritization. Right. right. So we'd have to process. look at, you know, go through all of the rural, residential, commercial, industrial, and then look at the next category, which is actually marginal yeah. lands, and look at all of those lands. And then we would have to look at all of the, the resource lands, so all farm and forest lands. That's why Carolyn was saying there's a pretty high bar when it comes to looking at um, expanding into resource lands. So I, I don't have a good sense of what all that means in terms of staff time and effort. Well, I think at the, at the upfront level of doing the goal five inventory, there's a marginal cost for including that. They're already doing some other inventories. I think that that's still potentially reasonably a ne good next step. But the reason I made the point that I did and Carolyn uh, kind of affirm that was that we want to make sure that as you have these conversations as community members who are watching this they understand that we understand that there's a process for going through and we're not just saying yep let's look at that we're, we're looking at that within this broader context and understand that we have to step through some 
statewide processes to get there. So it could be, I mean, we're going to do this fuller alternative analysis pending your direction to staff. It could be that those other first tier lands prove not viable and we end up having to look at some other ones and we'll have done that. But then we would probably also broaden or the, the, the network casting to look at other lands. I don't know that we would <coughs> just look at this property. Right. So it sounds like you're not clear, but you're likely to do go into that process anyway. So adding this with a willing participant doesn't really hurt. I don't think it hurts us. I think we just have to be really clear that we understand what we have to do to get there. Right. It's not that first. Right, or instead of. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I just add to that that I, uh, in addition to the state process, I think we heard through the CRG process a real commitment to the protection of farm and forest land as we were looking to. So. Okay. Um, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that and uh, other issues people want to. Still have to vote on the motion. motion. We're back. To Oh, the mo is the motion included? That's a motion, okay. So ready to vote on the motion? All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. In opposition, two, it passes. And I so, know. pardon? I have a question for the council. Okay, so um, <coughs> that passes. And um, <coughs> thank you. Um, Emily, could you read the main motion I, uh, as is on the table right now? Or can the minister go to read, read the main motion? Is on the, table right now? the main motion is move to a oh, sorry. Move to direct the city manager to prepare for a formal adoption process, planning documents to establish a new urban growth boundary based on recommendations in the technical components document attachment A, and that carry forward the pillars and strategies described in the Envision, Envision Eugene draft proposal, March 14, 2012. Then could you, we have an amendment regarding the residential lands mix. Could you uh, read that amendment, uh, section one, mm -hmm. page two of, uh, of the te technical? Under the heading, on, on uh, attachment A, the technical components document, under the heading residential lands in the first box of the manager's recommendation column, uh, replace the existing text with the following text, direct staff to plan for a housing mix of 52% single family, 48% multifamily. It did. Okay, I would like to move that we change that statement to direct staff to plan for a housing mix of 55% single family, 45% multifamily. Second. Moved and seconded. Do we'll see any further discussion? Yes. Well, Pat, this is very interesting that you bring that bring this motion up. Um, I had a lot of heartburn about my vote yesterday, and I had, um, you know, I really am not as vested in the, the percentage rate as everybody else at this table. I really believe that the market's going to drive this, and I don't <clears throat> know that us going one point this way or two points that way is going to make a big difference. What I do know is that I got about 20 calls yesterday from people who obviously there was an email that went out to somebody from somebody in the community um, because I asked several people and they said well when I got the email last night so um, and I asked every one of those people where they lived and not one of them lived in my ward so my ward <laughs> isn't really telling me which way they want me to go so in that with that in mind I have to go by my intuition and I had originally not I don't really I don't want to use the word care, but I just feel like if we went 50-50, I'd be comfortable. If it makes um, people feel that their work was a value that we asked them to do for the months and months of this to go with the recommendations that they put in here, then I'm, I'm going to support that because I just feel like it's not, um, I, I really am not as vested in the numbers as everybody else is. I really think that it's a market-driven issue. But what I am concerned about is um, the work that people put in, and I know that it's, um, advisory but I also know that I spent a lot of time as a volunteer for this city and when I did work I expected it to be um, valued and used and there's a couple of things that weren't <laughs> and it didn't make me feel very good so um, I'm gonna support Pat's motion okay um, Chris and then Alan to kind of continue on with where Andrea is going um, you could say it's only three percent what difference does a three percent make? And and like that, three percent is maybe on one level a relatively small issue, but on another level, it's an extraordinarily monumental issue. And for me, it's from the standpoint that 
the city staff, technical advisory groups, resource committees, months of work, study, and calculation came into a 55-45 split. I'm not aware that, was, that there was any research done, conversation had, or meetings around 52 or 48. Has there been any calculation or work done around those numbers? Not specifically. I do want to clarify that our technical resource group did not make a specific recommendation to you on the mix. They felt that was a policy decision that you needed to make. But in the conversations and certainly with the community resource group work, there was a, a and all the public input that we brought back to you was general support for 5545. So we have not done specific analysis, although we have some breakouts of how, you know, numbers, if you go 52, it means this. If you go 55, it means that. But they did not spend a lot of time on that because I think, and I think it was Sean Bowles was at the table as Sue Pritchard said, we believe that's a policy decision for the council to make. I understand. And, and I think that's an important nuance to make. The, the council does have the authority and the power to change anything it wants to change. And I think with that power comes the responsibility, though, to make those changes in a very thoughtful and deliberate way. And I don't think in the middle of a meeting, taking all the work that's been done and saying, you know what, I think it ought to be 55. <coughs> um, is a thoughtful and deliberate approach. Uh, if we had study, if there had been conversation, if we had calculations, if there had been work around a 55-48 split, um, then that would have been built into what happened. But it isn't. It's, it came up just out of the air. You mean 52? 52, I mean. And so, yes, it's, it's only 3%, but it's 3% that isn't related to all this enormous amount of work that went on. And so I think it is a show of respect to all that work. It is a show of respect to... Um, the willingness of people to buy into something that they may not agree with entirely, but they're <coughs> willing to buy in, including myself. And for that reason, it would be very hard for me to stay bought in if I felt the document at its core level, because this percent is part of the fundamental of this document, um, doesn't contain a thoughtful and deliberate number. It contains an arbitrary number, in my estimation. Even though it's only 3%, it's an arbitrary number that's not true to the process we went through, and I wouldn't be able to support it for that reason. And that would be a terrible thing, because this document is supposed to be a document that brings us together and unites us, and what I don't want to see is this something as important as this document become a divisive one that splits the council and sends out a message that we can't agree on what we want. So, um, yeah, it's only 3%, but it's a very important 3% for, for those reasons. <coughs> Alan? So I, you know, I was the maker of the motion. Uh, I, I, uh, it was neither random nor was it arbitrary. Um, I personally, more Andrew was, I, I'm more of a 50-50 person. The, the way that the bookends were set up on this process <laughs> was that there were people pulling for 45 and there were people saying it should be 60. And in between there was this range of 50 to 55 where people were coming down. And there was no specific number that we can say, here is the exact calculation that we get to that says, we crank it into the black box and it says the number is 55. And, and I disagree with people's characterization of the 55% as consensus. It obviously isn't, <laughs> because there are a lot of people that don't agree with it. And um, there, there, there's a difference between uh, what I'd say a, a, a consensus number and people, and, and uh, landing on a number that seems not to, to, uh, uh, to have too much disagreement around it. There are still people in the 45 camp, there's still people in the 60 camp, there's still people in the 55 camp, and there's still people in the 50 camp. So where's, where does that leave us? My motion was to split difference and to come to a political compromise on a number that was, has rationale behind it, but has no specific formula attached to it that was a compromise number as well. So in that 50 to 55 range, we could have said, I could have said 52.5, but then I would have been chastised about having too many significant digits. Uh, so 52 seemed reasonable to me. It's, it's silly that we have to think in, in increments of five. I don't know why that's so. It had to be 55 or 50. It couldn't be 52. So um, uh, I don't. F I I understand the work that went into this. I still think that there, that that range was there. The CRG did not on purpose come up with a number for us. They came, they said it's somewhere in that range. We got multiple <coughs> people saying different things. The Sustainability Commission said it, they didn't come up with a number either, but they said it was more on the other end of the range. And other people said it should be on the other end of the range. So it was 
staff came up with the recommendation of 55. I didn't personally agree with it. I didn't personally agree with the industrial uh, analysis either, but I understood wh where it was coming from and, and agreed to it. Um, uh, I don't feel like uh, this body as a council should just rubber stamp things. I think we should think through them, come to political compromises, and synthesize all the information that we get and try to come up with something that's workable. Just because one part of it we disagreed with doesn't mean the whole thing is, is disrespected or disregarded. Uh, so that was the intent behind my motion, which was to, to come to a compromise that split the difference of where I think the majority of people lie, and uh, which was 52. It could have been 52.5, but then that would have been uh, 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 probably not the right number. Um, I don't know what the exact right number is. And as Andrea said, and I you said another last round? time, it's, it, the market's going to determine this. <coughs> George. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, it, we have to remind ourselves, or remember, that the Citizens Research Group didn't recommend, didn't pass on as a firm recommendation any number. They left that as a policy decision up to us, which is as it should be. I mean, we've been following this whole process with varying degrees of attention for the last two, two and a half years, however long it's been. And so, you know, um, I think Councilor Zelenk is, I agree with everything he said about about picking that number. We we can pick the number. That's what we're supposed to do. That's a policy decision for us. It, it, it implies no disrespect whatsoever for all the intense amount of work that, that people did. Because there wasn't, e there wasn't unanimity on the civilian, uh, you know, the citizens resource group about what the proper mix should be. There was a wide range of individual uh, ideas about that. Sustainability Commission weighed in with some ideas. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this, this, the 5248 split is much closer to what current and, and very recent trends are anyway. It hasn't been 6040. It's been closer to this. So and I, I think, you know, like once we make a decision to revisit it two days later just because people send out a whole bunch of, you know, emails, I think we should be able to make up our mind. But, you know, by the time we take a vote and, and not keep changing the vote shortly thereafter just because some people mobilize, um, so I, I think that's maybe not a good way to do public policy. Um, Besides, we're going to revisit this in five years anyway, and we'll see how the how the market performs in those five years, and we can change it. We can make it 60-40 then if that's where it's going. I don't think that it will. I think all the trends show that it's going to be to the lower the lower mix. But every every reasonable argument I've heard is that that's kind of what's happening pretty much around the country now. <coughs> Even in the boom boom Sun Belt, there, there's there's a lot more multiple <coughs> family housing being built than, um, than single family. So I'm I'm gonna stick with the uh, mix that we came up with on Monday. Thank you, Daddy. Okay, um, valuing people's work does not mean agreeing with it, and we are the decision makers, and we have the right to listen to all the people in the community and to think ourselves too. Um, I have heard from no people who I am consider knowledgeable and who have no interest in, no financial interest at least, no interest other than the interests of the community, who do not agree with the, uh, the motion that we have here. Um, as far as coming up in the middle of a meeting, I don't see anything at all wrong with that. That's where else um, I think we're not supposed to deliberate outside of a meeting and we listen to everyone when the when the topic comes up I think uh, it's quite all right to bring up anything and I've made it clear all the time I do not think we should expand the urban growth boundary I think the most that we need to protect the farm and forest land for the benefit of the people living now and the people who will live here in the future uh, the seven pillars sound fine that you can you can interpret them in all sorts of ways but the one about um, climate and energy, plan for climate change and energy resiliency is probably the most important to our continued existence or our continued health. And that involves not having people drive long distances to their homes, 
not having the food come from a long distance, and protecting the air through preserving the forest, for example. That's some, some of the things. Um, the fact that we're going to be flexible, we'll review it in five years. If in five years there are good arguments for expanding the urban growth boundary, we could consider it at that time. We have the power now to, to adopt a housing mix that does not require expanding the urban growth boundary and to decide that we will provide for the kinds of industries that can live, that can exist on the spaces we have and that could be used in other spaces if we could clean up some brown fields. There are brown fields that could be cleaned up and which is environmentally good as well as staying within our boundaries. <clears throat> and as I said at the last meeting, uh, we talk about intergovernmental cooperation, doing things where they're best. If this county is considering developing or planning for industrial development in the Goshen area, maybe we could find a way to cooperate with them and think of what would be good for the whole region instead of just using figures to push things out. Thank you. Pat? Thank you, Mayor. Um, good, good conversation, most certainly. And uh, you know, there, there's a letter in the paper this morning that talked about how the Planning Commission uh, fell down on this. And once again, the Planning Commission wasn't unanimous, but they did support. Um, let's see, the citizen volunteers devoted, <coughs> devoted hundreds of hours participating in, invi in advisory groups, and uh, and they they supported the 55, 45 minutes. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, I think. Um, we, we will be looking at it again in five years. And, uh, and as Councillor Ortiz has uh, pointed out on numerous occasions, it will be market driven. And if indeed the market continues to be the way it has been for decades, which uh, principally is ruled by single family dwelling, then, we'll, then this will be a, a prudent step that we've made. If it changes, if it reflects some of the recent trends, which uh, include a lot of student, new student housing, which kind of tilts the mix toward uh, multifamily dwelling, well, then we'll be able to make that decision too. But currently, to jump from 62% uh, to 55 is a prudent step in the correct direction if, uh, if, um, that, if moving toward more multifamily <coughs> dwelling is inside of uh, the metropolitan area is what, we, what we're looking for. Regarding carbon footprint and regarding driving uh, fewer miles to work, we're all in favor of that. I'd, I'd much sooner drive fewer miles to work. I'd much sooner that people didn't live in Harrisburg and work in Eugene. I'd much sooner people didn't live in Benita and work in Eugene. And, uh, and I'd much sooner that the property values in Eugene didn't continue to widen between Eugene and the outlying communities. Uh, by providing more single family residential land inside of the urban growth boundary, then we are making it, taking one step toward making housing more affordable inside of the current metropolitan area. And we would all, we've all stated that we would like people to live closer to where they work. People indeed, and in fact, work by and large in Lane County. They work in Eugene and Springfield. Driving fewer miles by living inside of the Eugene urban growth boundary has to meet everybody's goals in that respect. So uh, I voted in favor of Councilor Zelenka's motion in the last meeting, and I too will be changing my vote. Mike. <coughs> thank you, Mayor. I want to say thank you to Andrea for being a big enough person to reconsider her decision. Um, I think that um, one of the one of the things I'm most proud of in my opportunity to serve the community in the last couple of years has been that we've kind of changed the nature of how the council works together in the last couple of years. I think I've, I've I can't tell you how many dozens of times I've heard from people that our work at this table is like less acrimonious than it's been in a long time, and I think that's because we've to a large extent. It's also been the work of the staff and the work of our manager that's helped us to work together in a different way, to help us look at things differently and to help us be more thoughtful and more deliberative and less conflict-oriented and less fight-oriented. And I think this process was a great example of that. And for me, that's why it was such a big deal that we honor this process and, and the, the results of it. Um, and I'm happy to see that, that we're, it seems as though we, we are staying on that path. That gives me great hope. Thank you. So I'm just going to make a few comments here. I think it's, uh, I'm very actually respectful of the different perspectives and points of view around this table. Um, I'm less 
happy when sometimes people's particular uh, perspective is used to make others sound less than. Um, I, I come out of this with really mixed feelings. I have a uh, lot of respect for, uh, an immense amount of respect actually, for our staff and for the manager and the work that's been done by, uh, through the whole process. In fact, at the very beginning, I asked the manager for us to have a different kind of process than we normally had where we would lock down on the growth and no growth side and sit there and yell at each other across the chasm and come out with a um, sort of a gut-wrenching whatever we came out with. So I have been a big fan of the whole process. And I'm going to support, um, I'm going to support wherever we end up here. But I am going to say today that what gives me sort of heartburn in, at this moment in time is that from my perspective some of us in this community who um, strongly tried to stay within the UGB as long as we could were willing and able to have a conversation about looking beyond that. Some of us who thought uh, perhaps we didn't need as much industrial land as was being proposed got to the place where we said well okay it, we are gonna, we're not sure that you're right about this, but we're going to go with it. And then some of us were not so keen on the notion of some of the locations of the housing, but we're willing to look at that. And so it seemed to me that some of us were, were, were moving, moving, moving on things that we really cared about because we were trying to have this conversation <coughs> with the whole community. And even to the point of uh, some of us thinking, that 55% uh, from multi was better than the other, the opposite. And so even when it got to 50-50 discussion, we said to ourselves, I said to myself, well, 50-50 still feels like you're not nodding your head enough to the people who are over on the single family dwelling. So I'm willing to go be way beyond my comfort zone from the 55 to the 50 all the way over to 52, because I'm trying to nod my head to the folks that um, on both sides and trying to move us together. And then we get the phone calls and we get the message delivered that either you go for the 100% or you're a traitor to the whole cause and you will blow everything up. And so the thing that comes before you is you've gone through this whole journey trying to put your faith in your ability to listen to everybody, to fully participate, to encourage the whole process, and then to make your best judgment. And then if you made your best judgment and it wasn't 100%, it wasn't going to be enough. So that leaves me with a little bit of, I'm so happy we took the journey. I'm so happy for all the participation. I feel like we are growing as a community and how we converse with each other. But I actually don't feel really good today. So that's my, that's my point. Yes, Betty. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with disagreement. I think it's healthy. I think uh, all angles should be discussed and thought about, and, and everyone should have a right to speak. I think what we need is an alternative proposal, along with this proposal, to go to every neighborhood in the city and with more with more public input, with more people considering the consequences of whatever we do. And I, I, I am disturbed that when people think it's not good to disagree, it is, it is um, I think it's very, it's one of the things that, when I first came to Eugene, it's one of the things I loved about it. One thing, the environment is <clears throat> really great, the bike paths, I couldn't believe how good they were, and the fact that people are actively involved in the community and actively saying what they think and working for it and fighting for it and daring to disagree. Thank you. Ready to vote on the motion, Pat's motion. All those, in, oh. sorry. All those in favor, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five, in opposition. One, two, three, it passes. We're back to the main motion as amended. All those in favor? Her. Main motion. Main motion being <coughs> overall with all the amendments. Yes. Are we in need of doing any more? 
if you're right. done deliberating. The, um, the only change then from what I read earlier is that the motion concerning the mix would no longer be part of the package you're voting on. And the DAC trust. Okay. And the DAC trust that passed. Say that again. Yeah. How about just to be really clear on what you're voting on? Yeah. yeah. Shall we? Please, that would be good. Um, sorry. The motion is to let me describe what attachment A is in the main motion. The main motion refers to attachment A that was attached to your last packet as amended in these ways. The under the commercial and industrial lands heading for land for industrial jobs subheading in the manager's recommendation column add a box C that states direct staff to include consideration of compatibility issues between industrial and residential uses and expansion areas. Direct staff to include consideration of environmental justice issues related to the siting of industrial uses in expansion areas. Revise the land for parks and schools heading to read land for parks, schools, and government. And under that heading in the manager's recommendation column add a third box that states direct staff to further analyze the pros and cons of adding the airport to the UGB. Also under the residential lands heading in uh, and the lands for single family homes subheading in the manager's recommendation column box D uh, add the DAG trust property to the list of potential single family home expansion areas that staff would continue to analyze. The housing mix said. It's, it's as the housing as mix is as is, so that's not a change to the document. So the main motion is moved to direct the city manager to prepare for a formal adoption process, <laughs> planning documents to establish new urban growth a new urban growth boundary based on recommendations in the technical components document A as amended, and that carry forward the pillars and strategies described in the Envision Eugene draft proposal dated March 14, 2012. Okay. All those in favor, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five, six. In favor and in opposition, two. It passes. Thank you for all the hard work, everyone. And I think we're done with the business of the day. Mm -hmm.